Brothers, if you want to turn to a place in your Bible, you can turn to, uh, let's see, Deuteronomy 6 and Proverbs 4, Deuteronomy 6 and Proverbs 4. I just wanted to start by really just saying thank you to all of y'all. I feel really honored to, yeah, just come out to uh, spend this time with y'all. I love uh, men's retreats. We do them uh, at our church, uh, which our church has only been in existence for about eight years now as a uh, Daniel shared that was a church that we moved down to uh, New Orleans to start. And so just, yeah, very grateful to be with y'all. Joe, thank you for your testimony. I uh, feel stirred up and just uh, helped by that. And just hope for the short time I have with y'all just to get to know y'all a little bit and be of some encouragement to y'all. As you know, you often hear Paul write wanting to be encouraged and be mutually encouraged himself. I hope that's what this uh, weekend can be for us. Um, well, let me just uh, speak. So, uh, on the topic, so uh, you are given the uh, introduction. So, yeah, if you look in the, the handout that um, Daniel provided for you, you you'll, you'll see my kids don't look 13, 10, and 9 there. That's just on me not getting, uh, I guess, a, a more up to date picture uh, to Daniel. And uh, yeah, so uh, thankful, grateful for Annie, my wife, who um, been married for 15 years. And yes, at our 15 year anniversary, we found out we were pregnant with our fourth one. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're uh, ready to start start again, start over again, uh, back to diapers. So, uh, uh, but very grateful uh, for our children. And uh, yeah, so uh, but when it comes to thinking about fatherhood, um, I, I mean, I think. It's always personal, right? right. You, you can't, I mean, all of us, you know, whether we've had a good father or a neglectful father or an abusive father, um, we're all sons to somebody, right? Um, I was telling Daniel, even coming here uh, this morning, uh, we went to lunch, I flew in, and I was like, man, if I get a, if I get a chance, I'm going to get a power nap. I said, not because I just had to get up so early, but... Uh, my dad today uh, had to have go. Uh, he had to have stress uh, a stress test for his heart. Um, he had a heart attack when he was 49, and another heart attack when he was 59. Actually, during March of 2020, we couldn't even go in the hospital. Um, and he uh, had open heart surgery, had a double bypass, and then they were here recently thinking one of his bypasses uh, was failing. And so, as I'm flying out here today, my dad, uh, you know, is having a uh, a stress test done and so I'm just you know I was nervous all last night you know is my dad gonna have another heart attack as they try to you know get his heart rate up and things like that but my lack of sleep last night is connected to someone right it's connected uh, to to my my own father and and I'll, and I'll say this I always try to do the best I can to honor my father but my father was not a believer uh, when I was growing up um, so I grew up my mom taking me to a small United Methodist Church um, one that, you know, actually preached the Bible and uh, was small and humble. Uh, and, and, my, and my mom, she married, I, you know, I think I was telling Daniel this, thankful for the providence of God, I wouldn't exist. But uh, for, for if she had not been foolish, but she foolishly uh, married an unbeliever. My dad uh, came from a Mormon background, but he was a, he was a rebel and, uh, and was, uh, you know, it's not like he left Mormonism for anything better. He was, he's, he was agnostic. So he'd never go to church with us. Uh, that always affected my parents' relationship. So fatherhood, to me, has always been kind of a complicated subject because uh, in my dad, I saw so many good, so many good attributes of fatherhood. Um, but on the other hand, there was other things that seemed to be missing, which when I was young, I didn't understand that. Um, with his, not just his relationship with the Lord, but his relationship with my mother. So when I was young, my dad... I mean, he was all about investing in me as an athlete. So whether it was football, baseball, I played basketball, but I fouled out like every game. So like you can imagine what type of basketball player I was. Uh, but every, every, uh, you know, and, and it's funny. My dad, he wanted me to be a pitcher, and I'd get out in the yard with him. He'd sit on the bucket, throw numerous balls to him, and they would be going here and there. I mean, I could throw hard. You just know where it was going. So I ended up being a catcher, and. Uh, my dad put the number 18 on me. He wore Archie Manning's number. And when he played quarterback, he wanted me to be a quarterback so bad. Ended up being a fullback and linebacker and played fullback in college. So I just I could not live up, you know, to what he wanted me to do. But my dad invested in me, um, and he spent uh, what people, I guess, would call quality time. Uh, I can, when I think of my dad, I think about stopping 
at the gas station and getting York peppermint patties and, uh, and an icy. You know, he was someone who was always wanting to do something uh, with, his, with his son. And, uh, and, 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 and he, he did that well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get towards uh, a father's affirmation and encouragement on the last session. But, um, but what was missing, and I remember hearing uh, one of the greatest eulogies I heard get, given at a funeral one time, and I had to preach the graveside. So after the eulogy, I was just like, what did I have to say? Mm-hmm. You know, when a son gets up and honors their father in such a way, you're just like, man, what, what else is there to be said? And I will never forget uh, what this man said. He was a, he was a relative of mine. Uh, but uh, he got up and he said a lot of great things about his dad, but I, I will never forget what he said here he said every day uh, when my dad came home uh, he wouldn't play with us just yet Uh, he would go make a pot or my mom would have a pot of coffee ready and they'd sit down and they'd talk and he says I just had this vivid in my memory of my dad sitting down with my mom and he said he said something along the lines of this he said the greatest security that a father can give his children is how he loves their mother And, um, and, and it clicked for me then I was like, that's what I missed out on. Because my parents did not have a good marriage. My dad ended up leaving about three times uh, while I was growing up. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of that stemmed from them just my mom being a believer. He was not a believer. Uh, and then uh, they eventually divorced uh, when I was in college. And, uh, and that entered into another hard phase. And I may talk about that a little bit more, just trying to be reconciled to my dad, trying to call him to repentance and trying to even – years after that maintain a relationship with him as he moves on and marries someone else so uh, you can see these 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 this topic gets real personal right now as a pastor I think about like the importance of this topic because now I'm getting close to 40 which you know I know some of you older guys in here but like you're still young I know <laughs> but you, when you get closer to 40 it starts getting all the more real that like uh, I'm at least probably halfway through you know? and uh, and uh, yeah but you start pastoring, you know, 20-somethings and 30-somethings uh, who, uh, in my estimation, and I'm sure this has always been the case, but it seems all the more so now, but just, and particularly young men, but just directionless men, men who are just hungry, starving for someone to tell them what to do. And not just to tell them what to do, but to tell them, am, am I doing it right? And am I doing it good? And brothers, I'll just say this has been a burden of my heart. It's been something that has broken my heart to see particularly young men, and we can say young women too, sons and daughters who've never had a daddy say to them, good job. Who've never had a daddy say to them, or maybe this way, don't do that. And if you, if you do it again, I'm, I'm going to do something about it. Just the, the accountability of discipline and correction uh, brother, I would just say recently what I've seen is just directionless boys, whether they, come, whether they come from places where fathering was neglected, abused, or perverted in some way. Regularly, I, uh, I pastor young men and young women who come from single-parent homes or parents who have been divorced or a dad who was in the home, but his eyes and his attention were uh, a million different places than their children. So um, given this, it, 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 I just thought to myself, um, well, Daniel reached out to me, and, uh, and, and if you don't know my credentials, this is the first time I ever taught at a men's retreat. So, yeah, first one, maybe the last one. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I was like, what am I going to say to uh, uh, some men? And, and I said, why not fatherhood? And, and, and it's just because of what Daniel said before. Uh, brothers, I believe this. Um, every man has the capacity to father. And I, and I think it's true whether you get married or, or not. Like, because I have men I can name in my life mm-hmm. who are single men who, who fathered me. Wow. They, they invested in me. They, they, they corrected me. They, they poured into me. And, and so what I'd like to just give you this weekend, I can't say everything. And look, there's wisdom in this room. Uh, it's very clear. I've, the most I've fathered up to now is the age 13, mm-hmm. right? My son's going to turn 14 here in a month. Um, there's... Many in this room, you know, you're well ahead of me, and I, and I could sit at your feet and learn what I, how, do I, how do I pastor uh, adult children. But I hope, like this, if anything, this would be just a, an encouragement, a win in yourselves to be like, man, I want to pour into young men. I want to 
pour into those who maybe are not being poured into. And that goes to discipleship, right? That's what discipleship is, is walking with people, teaching them about the Lord, encouraging them, correcting them, bringing reproof into their life. So uh, I want to give you really three talks on uh, fatherhood, and this is how I want to break them up. I want to talk about instruction, discipline, and encouragement. I think that's what a father has to give to his children, instruction, discipline, and encouragement. So if here's the thing. If we just get instruction, then all we are really getting is a teacher. And listen, you can find that anywhere. You can find that now, especially today. I, I love listening to podcasts. You can watch YouTube videos, um, which I, you can even look at a lot of young men today. What are they doing? They're flocking to these male influencers online because maybe they didn't receive that themselves. So they're looking for someone, tell me what I need to do. But, I mean, if you only get instruction, you what? You're, you just basically had a teacher. So not only do you need instruction, but you need what? You need discipline. You need correction. And, and, and this, is, this is essential. And we'll even see uh, in tomorrow's first talk on why discipline is such an important characteristic of what it means to be a father. Someone needs to hold us accountable. Someone needs to present us with consequences. But here's the reality, and I know this from so many coaches that I've not only coached with but been coached by, some of them know how to tell you what to do and they know how to get on to you, but they don't know how to encourage you. They don't know how to build you up. So it ends up being what? A cold relationship. Yeah. Oh, you know, how to, you know how to tell someone what to do, and then you know how to get on them, but you had never told them that you were proud of them. Right. Yeah. You never said, man, good job. I see you. And so that's yeah. going to be our last talk, uh, encouragement. A father is not someone who just teaches, not someone who just corrects. A father is someone who encourages. A father is someone who strengthens the heart. A father is someone who communicates his love to his children. A father lets his children know that he is pleased with them. A father shows affection to his children. That'll be our last talk. Now, like I've already said, I want this to be broad for y'all. I want this to apply to everyone. By the end of this talk, I'm even gonna ask like, who can you pour into? And I want you to be thinking of that. Like even if you're a young man, who can I be fathering, right? And, and even if you've like, your children have moved on and they're having their own children, you still are fathering, right? Yeah, I know, I, I see the heads nodding. Yeah. Yeah. So Ephesians 6, 4, I'm gonna read this and then um, we'll pray and ask for the Lord's help. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Father, we pray, God, would you bless the reading, Lord, and the teaching of your word, Lord, that we may see the very glory of God in the face of Jesus and become all the more like him. Lord, we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you look to the scriptures, it's clear. Like, like we even see here, fathers, bring up your children in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean, like, hey, moms, just take a, you know, a back seat. You don't have to worry about this. Now, we even see that in the Proverbs, right? There's this assumption. So I think, like, when Paul, is in his letters, really addressing fathers, he's saying, you lead out in this. Like, so if mom's trying to do this, and you're not doing this, there's going to be problems, right? Dad has to lead out. Now, one of the things I want us to see this weekend is connect really all these emphases that I'm giving to you to God, right? To connect them all to God. These emphases on the roles of fatherhood to who God is as father. And this is the first thing I want you to see is that God is father of all. And we see the fatherhood of God in creation and redemption. God reveals himself as father in the sense that all creation comes from him. He, he is the source. He creates out of nothing. And not only does God bring his creation about, but God sustains his creation. God cares for his creation. Just, just, just as, as a father would, God creates humankind as the crown of his creation and seeks to be in fellowship with him that, that that he may know them and they know him and this fellowship we know is what is broken by their sin by our sin but god even in that shows himself to be the gracious father who desires to redeem a people to himself who will be called his children we see this really by the whole existence of the bible from genesis 3 onward but we particularly see in that God pursues redemption uh, by making a covenant with a sinful people. We can see this with Abraham, of whom Israel came, and Israel is seen even throughout the Old Testament as God's son. They're supposed to represent him to the nations. They are to reflect his character to the nations. 
And though God regularly delivers Israel, this son continues in the way of Adam and rebels against their redeeming father. Then we see the true son of Israel come. And comes in who? Jesus. And Jesus does what no son of Israel or Israel in general does for the father. And it's this, that he pleases his father. He perfectly displays his glory. He reflects the goodness of God the Father, and the Father takes delight in him. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that really in the last talk. But what I want you to see first is that God is not only a God who creates, but God speaks to his creation. This is so important for us to see, even as we're called as fathers to instruct our children. We're being called, speak to them. Tell them what to do. And this is the glory that we see about the God that we worship. He is mysterious, but God reveals himself. He creates a world, and he reveals his glory to this world. We even say it like this. God reveals himself to and through creation. So with God as the father of all creation, we see that he speaks through creation. Now, how does he do that? Well, we can see in Romans 1, it's clear that the creation clearly displays the eternal attributes of God so much so much that we're left without an excuse. Nobody can say, well, I didn't know there was no God. No, it's, it's in your face every day. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and, the, and the fact that you would say that it's not, it's just showing that you are suppressing the truth mm-hmm. that is before you every day, that your creator has created this world. And his glory is all before you. Psalm 19 even says this, that the heavens, what? They declare his glory. And Jesus even teaches that we are assured of God's care because we can walk outside and we can see birds getting on the ground, plucking worms out of the ground and that's jesus way of saying look god is the sustainer god is the provider it all the creation shouts to us the character of god and god not only reveals through creation but god reveals himself through works and through words god also speaks directly to his people through his powerful acts of deliverance and judgment think of the exodus or think of how he would raise up judges to deliver his people in the time of judges he also raises up prophets and apostles and even his son Jesus Christ and God speaks in ways of command and instruction and through covenantal promises that his people would believe in him so God gives us promises to trust in and he gives us clear commands of how we are to live that we may honor him and even as the Old Testament we'll see here in a little bit from Deuteronomy and Proverbs 4 do these things and you will live there's the promise of life that comes with it and then we see this even in in Ephesians 6 God is not just revealing himself through creation. God is not just speaking through his prophets and his apostles and his son. He's not just speaking through his works that he does of deliverance. He then looks at parents and says, tell this to your children. Tell this to your children. This is, there's this assumed derived authority that is all over the Bible. And one of those derived authorities is this, is fathers and mothers representing God to their children. This is why... Why children are called what? Honor your parents. Honor your parents. And you. this is the first uh, command that comes with a promise that you would live long in the land. Honor your parents. Why? Because God has put them there before you to speak God's word to you, which makes, which makes it so understandable to us why it is so sinful and horrible and ugly to see a parent who would neglect that relationship mm-hmm. or abuse that relationship. They are to be reflecting the goodness and care of God to their children as they speak to them. And we don't just see this with parents, but we even see this in the church, right? You have pastors who, Lord willing, are pastoring and shepherding the church in a good, God-honoring way. But above pastors is what? A chief shepherd, the good shepherd. And we even see this with governments, right? Governments, even pagan governments have been raised up by God to use the sword to punish evil and to... Uh, reward good in the earth, but it is a derived authority from the judge of all the earth who will one day judge and righteousness. Mm-hmm. Now let's let's just look at Deuteronomy six right quick, just to see um, this expectation that God has for fathers to speak His works to His children. Deuteronomy six. I'm hoping we'll have time to read a little bit of Proverbs four just to see this as well. To see this responsibility. And I think that's what I want you to feel here. I want you to feel God sees you as the one responsible to speak. And this isn't something new. This is something he was doing with his people of Israel. And even as we read in Ephesians 6, 
He's looking at fathers and saying, speak to your children. As I have created and spoken to you, have revealed my character to you, speak it to your children. All right, we'll, we'll read the whole thing. Now this is the commandment. The statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you're going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his commandments and his, and, or by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them, listen to this, diligently to your children. I mean, you've got to love the words that are supplied to color your imagination in the Bible. He doesn't say you shall teach them half-heartedly. Mm. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyard and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall fear, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you test him at, Ma at, Ma at, Ma at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all of your enemies from before you as the Lord has promised. Listen, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. Listen to that. To do this for our good always, that he may might preserve us alive. And we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. If you go to Proverbs 4, you know, you see a similar thing, di different genre here, but this call um, or you see this responsibility picked up uh, for, for fathers to speak to their children. So Proverbs 4, and really you see this all over the book of Proverbs, right? But it says Proverbs 4, I won't read the whole thing, just want to give us a little taste here. Hear, O sons, a father's instructions, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son, when my father tendered the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. 
Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. He continues with the same things, but I just want, to, want you to just get a taste of that from Proverbs 4 and Deuteronomy 6. What do we see here is to be taught to a child. Now, it's really particular in uh, Deuteronomy 6, but I, I think in general, if we look at the scriptures and what we are to do as fathers and leading and teaching our children, as first, we've got to show our children from the scriptures who God is. That is where they're to be oriented to. And in seeing who God is, then they can see who they are. Who they are. I mean, just even think about, like, how can you be an Israelite and not understand your story, right? And look, the, the, the temptation there is what? For them to forget it. And then when they forget it, what do they do? They start pursuing things that will not honor the Lord. They will start pursuing other gods. By retelling the story to them, they're reminding them of, this is who God is. And because this is who God is, this is who we are. So who God is, who they are, and what flows out of who they are is what they are to do. I, I mean, maybe the reason we have so many directionless young men today is they just don't know who they are. Just even in general, at a common grace level, who they are as a man. What am I to do? Daddy, tell me what to do. And Daddy, tell me if I'm doing it right. We are to tell our children who God is, what he has done, who we are, in light of who we are, what we are to do. And listen also to this, why they should heed God's word. I think something's really clear if you read, I mean, this is all over the Proverbs, and it's really all over the scriptures. But you see in Deuteronomy 6, and you see in Proverbs 4, why are you to heed God's word? I mean, there are many reasons, but it's for your good. Do this. And you will live. I mean, we just heard testimony from Pastor Joe. When, when you pursue sin, and this is what we try to t tell our children. Now, this is kind of getting over to this one. Often when I would have to spank my children, I'd say, this is painful, right? But I'm trying to give you a taste that you would see this, is this is what sin leads to. Sin leads to misery. Sin leads to destruction. And that's, that's what Pastor Joe was Tasting, and that's why he said when people would ask me to pray for others that they would be saved, what, what did you say? Trouble. Get them a tr Yeah, help. And, and really, what you're saying there, help them see where this is going quickly, right? And, and, and the promises we see here, right, with uh, uh, keeping God's commandments, with, with following God, worshiping Him, fearing Him, keeping and telling His story of what He has done for Israel is if they do it, they will live. Mm -hmm. Now, where is this to be taught? We see where is this to be taught? When you sit in your house, mm -hmm. when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's it's just the Bible's way of saying, oh, what you say? So where is it? Where isn't it? Where yeah. isn't it, right? And I think right here, like what I love about Deuteronomy 6 is there needs to be a readiness to speak, mm -hmm. right? A readiness to speak. Daddy, why don't we do these things? Mm -hmm. You know, and the assumption there is like, well, let me tell you about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't forget, son, we were in the house of slavery. Mm -hmm. And God mm -hmm. took us out of slavery through the Red Sea. Amen. And listen, when we got to this land, there were already vineyards here. Mm -hmm. that We didn't even have to do any work. Like, it was all here for us from God's hand. There's a readiness. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think this means that you necessarily have to have family worship every day, but I do think it means this, that talking about the works of God and the way we follow Him is just a part of our life. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been trying to be more intentional with this with my oldest son, so uh, me and him spend a good bit more time alone because he's going to a different school uh, than his younger siblings, uh, so our two youngest, they kind of go to like a hybrid Christian classical school. And, Bryson's going to a five-day school now. Um, some of you maybe heard, I don't know if you're a big football fans. it's called John Curtis in Louisiana. It's like uh, the, the coach that's there is the all-winningest coach in, in national high school football history. Mm -hmm. Like won 600, he had a 622nd win last year. So you start doing the math on that. That's insane, right? Um, it's a school where Joe McKnight came out of, if you all remember, played at USC years back, um, played for the Jets. But – 
so he's at this school. He's uh, he's he's playing football there. It's, he's he's played sports so like this is the first time playing at like you know an intense school. He's in eighth grade. Uh, but in 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 the in the vehicle, whether we're driving from practice or we're driving to school that morning, I'm trying to like you know I've had this kind of like oh I, I want to listen to a podcast, but I'm just like no, let's just turn it off. Like I will never get this time back with my son. I will never get this time back with my son. I know this is a 20, depending on traffic, 30 minute drive to school. And I will never get this time back with my son. It's not a planned Bible study, but I'm just asking him questions. Or just even like letting the door be open. He just got baptized this past mm-hmm. summer. So he, he knows the expectation on his life. Now in following Jesus, even when he's baptized, he asked the church to pray for him that he'd be a witness in his school. Mm-hmm. And so like we're talking about those things. And he's even... Asking me like that, that my my friends are saying this like, what should I say back? I think that's the type of things that are in mind there. Like, yeah, yes, do a a, a a a worship time with your family, whether that's once a week or how I have I have some people in my church every morning at breakfast. That's what they do. But I at least want all our parents to be thinking that there's this readiness. There's this readiness to speak truth to my children. Now, listen, why should it be taught? Why should it be taught to a child? One, of course we want our children to believe, and I think like this is how we should see fear in one sense, but we even see from Proverbs 4, see all over Proverbs, see in Deuteronomy 6, we should teach these things that they may fear God. And, 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 and this, this fear, and the reason I say it's connected to faith, is because when you look at fear in the Proverbs, it's, it's a fear that's contrasted with something. It's a fear that's contrasted with you revering your wisdom. It's a fear that is contrasted with revering the wisdom of this world. And the wisdom of this world leads to destruction. And so that's, that's, that's why we're speaking these things to them, is that we don't want them to be wise in their own eyes. We want them to hear God's word and to worship him. We see this is really the great trouble of the time of Judges, that everyone did what? What was right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. This brings chaos. Yeah. I think this is, this, is, <laughs> this is part of the reason we see so much chaos in our own Western culture. Mm-hmm. And another reason, why, why should it be taught to a child? Love. Mm-hmm. Love. Like this is the whole point. Jesus teaches this whole point of the commandments is what? That we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, obviously, we can't, I'm, I'm going to touch this in a moment, we can't do this without faith. We can't do this without the help of God. We cannot do this without uh, the Holy Spirit. And then we see another reason, I've already spoken to this, but life. Similar to what you see in Proverbs 4, God's word is to be given to his people so that they may live. That they may live. Those who keep God's word will live long in the land. In Proverbs 4, those who embrace wisdom, she guards them. She takes care of them. That isn't, that's not the prosperity gospel now, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. You all see what I'm saying, right? Like, like, this is not saying, hey, believe in Jesus and everything's going to be great for you. No, no, you, you will suffer, but if you embrace wisdom, even in your suffering, God is going to help you and keep you. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's what you want. That's what you want. Mm-hmm. Uh, last reason we should, uh, it should be taught to our, ch- to our children, remembrance. Children are to be taught lest they forget when they enjoy all the good things of the land that they would forget that God saved them from the Egyptians and then they go and serve other gods. Now, of course, we know the rest of the story. We know that Israel does what? She forgets. She disobeys. Though he would show her grace and send her judges and send her priests and send her kings and prophets to save her, and to remind her of his word, Israel was ultimately cast out of the land. Now, you may see that and think, well, what's the point of teaching? <laughs> what's the point of speaking to sinful, foolish people? We're all sinners, and people are going to disobey God. What's the point? And, and I would agree, but I would point you to at least two encouraging realities. One, Israel in general was rebellious, but even in her midst, you can find people who exercise faith in the Lord. Mm-hmm. I mean, think of Daniel and Babylon. I love mm-hmm. this. Think of Daniel and Babylon. Mm-hmm. I, I love looking at the faithfulness of Daniel while he is in exile. And then think about this. 
Why did he believe? I think because we don't have his name, but he had a daddy somewhere who spoke God's word to him. Now, that's a big name, but let's just take someone who's not as well known and only just mentioned in a short bit of space. But how about Anna, the widow in Luke 2, who is fasting and praying in the temple every day, looking forward uh, to the redemption of Israel, and Jesus is brought in her midst. Why did Anna fast and pray? Well, I would submit to you, I'm sure she had a mama and a daddy who taught her about what her God had done for them. Secondly, despite living in a sinful world, we should teach with hope because Christ has come. He has lived, he has died, he has rose again, he has ascended on high, and he has given his spirit whom he calls the helper. God in the new covenant has poured out his spirit in a fuller manner that his people may worship and love him. Now, what's the evidence of that? Well, 2,000 years of the gospel blazing across the world, not just confined. Think about this. Is it? Do you ever just like just try to ignite your faith by just looking at what has been accomplished that Jesus said he was going to do? This, this faith of Israel is no longer confined in Israel. We're in Texas. <laughs> the gospel has been here a long time and can still continues to go forward. I'm just amazed by this every week. Just thankful to be like in New Orleans and we'll have people there who are from Kyrgyzstan, from India, uh, from China. And we'll have Hispanics, whites, African Americans in our congregation just to think, man, Jesus' word is true. Jesus really is risen. So yes, are people foolish? They are foolish. But God, by his grace and power through the Holy Spirit, is still saving people and bringing people to himself. Now let me just kind of wrap up with this. But what are three ways a father needs to teach? So ways here, but you'll get what I'm saying here in a moment. First, and I think this has come out very clearly, but a father needs to be first teaching his children the gospel. We can't tire of that. The gospel. It is the, if the great responsibility of Israelite fathers was to teach their children that what God had done for them and bringing them out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, then, brothers, how much more for us who know of Christ, the Passover lamb, he who came and died and bled and rose again to regularly tell that to our children. Like, I, I don't think this would be true of anybody in this room, but let it never be said of us that when our children look at us and say, Daddy, why do we go to church? Why? Like, it should be, I mean, knee-jerk reaction. I mean, be ready to remind them. But knee-jerk reaction to our children, I know I'm going to church. I know. I know what Christ has done for me. Brothers, let us remind our children of the great works that have been done through Jesus. Be reminded of what Christ has done so that when a baptism happens, maybe your young child who's still learning about the faith says, Daddy, why do we baptize? Daddy, why, why, why do we take the Lord's Supper? Daddy, why do we read the scriptures before dinner? Why do we pray before bed? Why do we sing songs? And you would be ready in whatever way to say something like this, to remind ourselves to worship Jesus for what he has done for us. Think about how important a gospel-shaped vision is for just, and this is, I'm going to kind of transition to fruit, but the fruit of your family. I, I told you, uh, I grew up, my dad, uh, you know, he was a great dad to me, but my parents had a ton of conflict. A ton of conflict. Things that would get emotional, uh, yelling, and even physical at times. And, you know, as a young child, you're trying, you're trying to, like, think through these things, and you're trying to watch how your parents react to one another. <laughs> and kind of like what would happen in our house is if there was a big fight, you had a silent treat. And that, silent, that silence would sit over the house. Sometimes it felt like three days. Mm -hmm. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. Felt like I couldn't do anything about it. But you know why that silence was there? Because a great act of sin had happened. And there was no grace or power in that house to help him. Mm -hmm. Think about you teaching the gospel to your children. Mm -hmm. 
And for them to see whether it's you and your wife getting in an argument or maybe you sin against them, to show them not the reconciliation that we mm -hmm. preach about, but that we can exercise with one another. Mm -hmm. The gospel is what Jesus has done for but the gospel shapes even how we live in our homes. This gets into the second way that we need to teach. We need to teach our children wisdom. And I want to think about this in two ways. I want us to think of virtue and also want to think of discernment. Virtue and discernment. So those we father not only need to hear what Christ has done for them, but they also need instruction in what it means to follow Jesus now. What does it mean to love our neighbor? Okay? You got the gospel down. You know what Jesus has done for you. But now what does it look like to follow him? Mm -hmm. Like his pastor said a while ago, true faith mm -hmm. shows what? True repentance, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember like when I first got around some Baptist churches mm -hmm. when I was in um, high school, I heard a lot about true faith. Mm -hmm. And I'd even see people walk the aisle and come and say, you know, I made Jesus my Savior. Now I'm going to make him my Lord. I'm just like, and even at that time I was thinking, you can you do that? Like, wasn't that supposed to happen the first time that Jesus, you can't call Jesus your Savior unless he is your Lord, right? That, that, that I believe in him, and since I believe in him, I'm going to leave this life behind and follow him. I'm going to love my neighbor. What does it mean to exemplify the virtues of Christ? What does it mean to live life in this fallen and broken world? You know, when I think of this type of wisdom, I think this wisdom of virtue, I think of James 3, 14 through 18, it says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but it's earthly. Listen to this. Unspiritual. Listen. Demonic. Mm -hmm. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But then listen to this. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So wise living is virtuous living. It's repenting and seeking to walk as Jesus walked. It's putting all following, embracing virtues like faith, humility, courage, patience, kindness, self-control. It's walking in these fruits. But there's also, I, I, I tell you, brothers, there's a, a wisdom that needs to be imparted that comes from experience, or that can be described as an accumulated discernment. That's why I even said a while ago, I would love to sit at some of your feet. What, what should I be thinking of as I parent my teenage son? You know, what should I be thinking about as, you know, whether he goes to college or goes straight to work? Like, what should I be thinking of? I want to hear from men who have followed Jesus and done that, right? They've, they've gone down a path that I haven't gone down. Now, that, mm -hmm. now, just because you've gone down a path that others haven't gone down, that doesn't automatically equate you as wise. Mm -hmm. some, some people walk those paths ahead of us, and they do it in a foolish manner. Mm -hmm. now, now, what I'm saying here is I, I want to listen to those who've walked that wisdom of virtue, mm -hmm. and they also have that wisdom of discernment that they can share with me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think sometimes we can be slow to share really this type of wisdom because it's you know, it's not necessarily scripture that we're imparting to others. Sometimes it can even be ca in the category of advice that can be employed or not. But here's the reasons why we need to give such advice. Because men are looking for that advice elsewhere mm -hmm. on how they might be a better man. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need to speak it. And the practical advice that you give sometimes may be this. Hey, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I did with my family, but take it or leave it. it but, but still say it to them because they're going to hear other voices, whether it be from YouTube or podcasts. And the advice they're receiving may uh, make sense of the world, but it may be potentially leading them to a path of destruction. Uh, here's some things I've just seen myself have to speak through or speak to practically um, in my congregation, just uh, people trying to navigate relationships with their family. So I've already talked about, I've, I can think of one young man right now He's come to me multiple times. He doesn't know how to handle his relationship with his father. His father's been neglectful to him. He, he pretty much grew up with his grandma. He's a Christian. He's been a Christian for probably the past six or seven years. He wants that relationship with his dad, but almost every time he comes around his dad, his dad is mean to him. Um, he blames him for stuff, and he's just like, what, what, what did I do? I mean, like, 
I can turn to some scriptures and show us it, but he's asking, like, Pastor, what do you think I should do? Like, what would you advise me to do? Um, helping friends reconcile and not give up on a relationship. I see this so much, and this is not me on a young people trip, but so much now that a, a relationship can get labeled toxic and people just kind of give up on it, right? Like, no, like, this is, no, this, this relationship is just, it's hard. And, and you know, both have sinned against one another, but y'all need to, you need to be reconciled. Mm-hmm. Or what about work and finances? And, you know, I, I, I rarely, I'll even hear this from uh, younger people as well. I, what do I do in a job interview? Like, like just directionless. Just mm-hmm. simple advice just to talk to them. Should I push through the, with this job or should I find another one? Or, or, or think about fatherless men who have no direction when it comes to pursuing a woman. Uh, we now live in a digital world where some of the advice that men are starved for is how they should pursue a woman. And these may even be Christian women who they're trying to meet on a dating app and they don't know what to do when they go on that first date. I remember uh, I had a, a young man in my church and uh, he took this girl out for a coffee date. And uh, he, did, he, did, he didn't pay for it because he didn't want to appear as being toxically masculine. <laughs> And he didn't get a second date. <laughs> and I told him, I, you know, I told him, I said, dude, pay for the date. Pay for the date. Even if it's the first date, pay for the date. And if she's offended by that, you probably don't want to be with her. Like, it's a good, it's a good telltale sign. But he needed someone to say that to him. Like, in one sense, your heart has to, like, break. Like, they're wanting to be faithful. They're wanting to say, how do I take the truths of the scriptures and apply them to these nitty gritty nuts and bolts parts of my life and I've never had a daddy show me the way mm-hmm. or what about children you know we'll have questions you know in New Orleans with the school system what do we do for education with our children um, how strict do we need to be with you know certain rhythms or whether they should play this sport you know you're, if you're getting these questions like great like speak into them and if you need to say take it or leave it Take it or leave it. Be humble about even your own opinions that are informed by Scripture. And here's the last thing. The last thing I want to say. Example. Everything you teach your children will have almost no power if it is not accompanied with the teaching of your example. Mm-hmm. So much in our life is not always received by what is what taught, but by what is called. Mm-hmm. And one of the greatest examples, I've even alluded to this already, is if you want your children to know what it looks like to repent, they should know what that clearly looks like because they've seen it in you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You should be someone that they can follow in these ways. Now, what's at stake? Here's what's at stake, and this is what makes this so important. What's at stake is that everyone will be fathered by someone. Mm-hmm. Everyone will lend their ear in some direction. Mm-hmm. Everyone will walk some path Everyone will listen to someone. Someone See, it's not true that even the most individualistic and rebellious are walking their own path. It's not true. Mm-hmm. No, the Bible is clear. There are, there are two paths. There is the path of folly, and there's the path of wisdom. There's the path that is broad and easy, which leads uh, to destruction, and there's the path that is hard that leads to life. Mm-hmm. And what gets people to those paths are the words that they heed. And this is what is at stake. The enemy, since the garden, has been very ready to speak. Mm -hmm. He has been ready to speak. Ever since the beginning, Satan has been seeking to father. Mm -hmm. He has been seeking to have children for himself. Children that can be deceived and lied to. And he speaks regularly and he speaks deceptively. Mm -hmm. But his intentions, unlike a good father, are not for their good. His words are not so that they may have life, but Mm -hmm. so that they may have death. His intentions are to kill them. Mm -hmm. Brothers, that is what is at stake. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you now just, maybe you have some questions that you'd like to ask for them to to ponder on. But as you hear this about instruction and just the great call to teach, whether you're a father of young children right now or father of older children or grandfather children, or you're just a man in church and you're like hey I just want to disciple you know maybe some people in the youth or teenagers or whatever let, let me ask this, this question that you can just think about who in your church do you think you could give some direction through instruction 
Are there any directionless, rudderless boys in your congregation that someone just needs to come alongside them, put an arm around them, and let me say, let me show you the way. Let me help you out. You see, this fathering requires intentionality. Mm -hmm. It requires intentionality. So this this is a discipleship question. Mm -hmm. Who can you father in your congregation? Mm -hmm. And what would this look like? And just let let me encourage you. This doesn't have to be something grand and great. I've really been encouraged already by the hospitality. Michael, thank you all so mm-hmm. much for even just opening up your home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this, this, this type of, these type of things are how the church is built. Mm-hmm. God's word and God's people together, mm-hmm. um, sharing food together. like, And just even hearing about y'all setting up times to watch Band of Brothers together, I'm like, man, I hate that. I got to go back to New, <laughs> New Orleans. Like, I, I want to be a part of that. You know, yeah. just... Um, like, But I'll say this, like, since I didn't know what I was doing, and I'm I'm promise I'm closing here, I didn't know what I was doing when I would do this when I was in my 20s, and I I should have been old enough to just be my own man, Uh, but because of, I remember my parents striking their relationship, there was a couple uh, in our church, they were in their 50s, their kids were a little older than me, and every summer they just open up their home once a week. And we would do Bible study. It was the first time I'd ever done a Bible study where we'd start with chapter one and go through the whole book. And it changed my life. And all they would do is get all these students in their home. And they'd have food all over the table like that. And they'd just open up the Bibles. And he would just lead just a study through the scriptures by asking questions. That's all he did. And I remember, like, not just them opening up their home, but just seeing how he interacted with his wife, how uh, they loved one another. I remember, and I have I've reflected on this 20 years later, there would be certain nights where I'd get in my truck unannounced and I would drive to their house mm-hmm. just to be around them. Mm-hmm. Why? My heart was hungry. I wanted some sense of security that I felt in that family. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you think, oh, man, I can't, what can I do? There, there, you'd be amazed at what you can do. Mm-hmm. Amazed mm-hmm. at what you can do. I'll leave it at that. We'll pick up on uh, discipline and encouragement tomorrow. Um, but brothers, like I, I really, I just want to be an encouragement to y'all. I hope, uh, like, um, yeah, that you would be just encouraging. And if there's any ways that I can <clears throat> pray for you, I know this topic. Even as we think about ourselves fathering, I can't talk about this without thinking about my own father. And so, like, you know, the, the, those can be relationships that are that are mm-hmm. a lot of you know just hurt. And so, I, I would even love to pray for you um, mm-hmm. in that. But. Daniel, I just want to hand it back to you, brother. Yeah.